We're now moving on to Jordi Pardo. Jordi is the managing editor of the musculoskeletal group, one of the managing editors. And um, he's going to talk to us about the, his experience as a managing editor and his role as a managing editor in supporting the development of reviews and the editorial process. Thank you, Jordi. Oops. Uh, oops. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Carla. Uh, can everybody see my screen? I will assume you do, otherwise you will start screaming. Uh, thank you so much. So I'm going to uh, make a presentation. I tried to get a, a brief uh, outline of what I'm going to be talking about. And I will talk about all these three things, but I really want to focus on the last one. That is, I think, where it could be the meat of what we want to talk today. So first, I, I would like to, to say uh, you hear a lot about managing editors. A lot of you probably contact your managing editors uh, often enough. This is the definition on the revised job description of managing editors that we come around to summarize what the managing editors uh, do. And as you can see, there is a lot uh, of things here. Let's try to uh, unentangle uh, how that uh, comes into practice. First of all, I would like to uh, say that outside the editorial process, there is a lot of support available for author. And I'm going to go briefly with the things that we have around. There is a lot of Cochrane training uh, that is uh, available. Uh, you can log in with your Archim password for the things that are password protected. And it's absolutely a lot of material, but I highly, 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 highly recommend interactive learning. It has a, a fantastic uh, volume of uh, interactive materials to refresh your knowledge about uh, systematic reviews and even has new content like the equity model that probably for a lot of people uh, is going to be uh, a new thing. And it's uh, really valuable to refresh on what is the last things that Cochrane is trying to uh, promote. So highly recommend to have a look to that. It's really easy also to have a, a test to see how well you uh, are up to date in the things and then decide whether you need to read further or not. It's really wonderful materials, highly recommend that it's free for authors. Okay, there is also a, a training for editors. And a lot of times when I have a, a, an author that is having issues, I often go back to these ones to uh, provide an, a, a further explanation of uh, what is the problem that we are trying to uh, get here. And it's really useful as a way of uh, giving complex information to, to authors. So that's a second resource that I recommend. Of course, we have the handbook. Uh, I think that uh, one of my favorite uh, hobbies is to uh, copy and paste links to the handbook and send it to people to just refresh them of what is the latest guidance that we have. The, we released this uh, later version of the handbook less than a year ago. There are so major changes on some of the things we are doing. There are some new chapters with a, a lot of new information. And it's always uh, useful, even for me, when I'm going to tell something that's what the handbook says, to go back and reread and be sure that's what the handbook says. Because sometimes I have found uh, surprises of things that I thought that I knew and I actually discovered that I, I did not and or I, will, I did not get it totally right. So it's always uh, good to go back to the handbook and review the things that you need to produce. And finally, uh, we have the Mercedes standards that it's the uh, minimum standard reporting that we're expecting everybody to be able to put in the review. And this is absolutely crucial because most of the groups are using these Mercedes standards to set up quality checks. So it's extremely important that you're aware of what they are, what they, uh, what they say, and to be really close to it when you are writing your review, because that's extremely, it's going to speed up all your editorial process if all the items of the Mercedes standards are met when you're submitting your review. And you will say, well, we really awesome that you have these Mercedes standards next to your review when you're writing. And actually in Redman, you, you have that. When you click on this area here, where you see the red circle, the context, you activate this section when you can see the standards just showing what is accurate of what you are uh, looking at when you're writing your review. This works in Redman 5, this works in, in Redman Web, is absolutely a fantastic resource and it gives you the information that you need to do this uh, section of the review properly. And it explains why is this section important and you have the links to the handbook if you want to go deeper, if you say, I don't understand why I need to do that, then you have all explained there in simple links, really easy, really helps to get your review right. And why is all of that 
so important. And I, I'm going to go now to the overview of the editorial process. I took this figure from the interactive learning that I mentioned that I really like this resource. So on the left side, you can see what are the steps of doing the review. You know, that's what we are, you're an author and you are thinking uh, what I need to be doing. So you get your question, then you plan your review, and then you conduct the review the best you can, doing all the steps that you need to do your review, and finally you just publish it, and if necessary, you update the review later on. But parallel to this process of conducting the review, there are the steps in the editorial process that culminate on actually publishing the material. No? In the case of the title, to register it and put it into the website, to publish the protocol, to make everybody aware of what we are planning to do, to publish the review, to get the resources uh, available to everybody, or to publish the uh, update review. But how that uh, works, no? so how, we, how we go from title to protocol to review, uh, to, and therefore update and start uh, again. So let's go steps by steps. So when we are getting a new request for a title, so the first thing is say, well, do we have all the information to decide whether we should uh, do that? And then if there is missing information, we need to ask for that. And also importantly now, uh, we are going to be asking for declaration of interest for the, at, at the title registration so that, the, that we can see from the beginning whether the author is following the editorial policy of registering um, of uh, the conflict of interest policy of Cochrane or not. When we are having the, the form more completed with all the details we need and we see that the author, is, uh, the author team is, is okay to work with that, then we look at uh, what is the, the clinical assessment. Is that topic it's, uh, it's sensible? It's something that it's really an uncertainty that we need to solve. We look at the priority, how important is this topic? A lot of times, a lot of groups actually, they have already that solved. They have already set up what are the priorities and therefore you, get, you can just pick up from the titles that they already set up is the importance that they want to focus on. And finally, there is also a feasibility assessment. Is uh, We are looking into, uh, is people actually, uh, is the team able to uh, run this review and go to the end and finish it? And then from this perspective, we reach a final decision whether to accept or reject the title. And of course, you have a lot of iterations in the middle of saying, if you feel like, say, well, it will be that this group for this author team, they will really need to have a statistician because we expect with this kind of topic that there's going to be a lot of topics that you will need a statistical advice. So you may go to go back to them, make the suggestion, they may re uh, redo the form and then uh, solve whatever is the issue that they want to solve and, uh, and go away. What happened when we are uh, looking into protocols? So, well, again, so the first thing is that you check that everything that needs to be there is actually there. And then usually a lot of groups now are doing a first Messier screening, or just checking some basic elements of Messier and see it's all uh, there. And more and more often, a lot of teams are actually considering rejection uh, at this early time. So when you get the first submission, you look into it and said, is this protocol going to go uh, anywhere or actually it it took so long and now the topic is no longer a priority maybe we need to reject now and stop it before they do more work into it assuming that we decide that we want to uh, proceed then we have our uh, editors what that, uh, does a clinical assessment and they look at the methods of the review are really uh, w uh, the methods proposed are really well set up in order to uh, address the question that we are trying to assess we do a, a, a a method assessment to see it's, it's all the full series completed, not just the, the basic items. We look at the statistical uh, proposed, we look at the consumers to see is that something that is sensible for the consumer. And then finally, we look at the external referees that provide additional perspective to the review, that it could be uh, external referees that may be looking for additional topics of methods. We may look at clinicians to say, is, is really that formulated in a way that it's the way that clinicians are going to be addressing this question? And finally, we get the uh, co-ed uh, sign off at the end. And when we get that, we we'll go to the copy editing process and uh, all this other stuff. What we do for review, so the process is really similar to what we will do for the protocol, except that now we have a lot more data and therefore it's a lot more detail that we need to be lo uh, looking into it. But the general structure is the same. And now also we have an approval, not just from the co but also from the uh, senior editor of the network that needs to set up its own process in order to uh, validate that what is in the review is actually uh, okay. What we need to do with the updates, the updates, the process is uh, really similar from the reviews. However, at that point, we also make a call to say, is this update really substantial or not? Or uh, if it's not substantial, the changes are minimal, probably with just an internal look with the editors, maybe uh, enough. And we get uh, still the sign off if 
the process, if the changes are substantial, then we follow the same process we will do with the review. And all of that, you say, well, then what is the managing editor doing? Because all that seems pretty straightforward. Everybody's providing their comments, and then it's all fine. Well, uh, when things are going well, definitely uh, there is not so much to look into it. However, uh, a lot of times things don't go as uh, we are expecting. You know? And if, if we were just complacent and just thinking, oh, everything is going to be fair, all the comments are going to be addressed and so on, uh, that will be fine. That's rarely what it happens. When we are getting comments, authors may have a different, we, a different view, there is a discussion, and then there is an assessment of whether people have addressed their comments or not. Uh, they may be probably understanding what this means or what that doesn't mean. And basically, the managing editor is the, the person that is oiling all this process. It's helping to address all the things that are not going in the way that were uh, expected to be, helps to solve these issues and, and go away. Uh, is the uh, person who is going to uh, think everything that is not contemplated into the process but need to be done before the review gets published is the managing editor who is going to be taking the measures to ensure that we are getting this review uh, up to speed and at the levels of quality that uh, Cochrane require. Well, that was my brief presentation. Uh, I hope you like it and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Jordi. Uh, again, you can uh, ask questions, uh, either asking to speak or, or adding your question to the box. But while you were thinking of it, I have a question for you, Jordi. Uh, okay, go ahead. Because we do the webinar in two different time zones, it's very interesting. We had in the morning Emma Dennett speaking, and we had you in the afternoon. And uh, my question is, uh, what is your perspective in, in terms of the role of managing editors? Because if you if you if you were here in the morning and hear Emma Dennett speaking, so. Um, she obviously the, the 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 role is the same however her focus would be very much on supporting the authors and your focus this afternoon was very much on the editorial process so how do you see this complex role and the importance of this role i mean for for the development of reviews in cochrane well yeah like for instance so when we were looking at supporting the authors, all the materials that I have been mentioning, I'm constantly recommending to the authors to, to look into it. So the managing editor is the one who is identifying what are the, the gaps on, on knowledge, or understanding on what is happening in the, in the review. And it, that could happen at the level of the editorial group or it could happen at the level of the author team. So the, my understandings could happen in all the sides of our communication. And the managing editor is the responsible of Untangle all these issues that could be happening that are stopping the review from uh, happening and, and being of the high quality that we are expecting to be and ensuring that we are getting uh, this uh, review to fruit. So the managing editors are constantly making decisions on, on, on saying, uh, is, is that enough? Is that clear enough? Do we need to ask a clarification? Is, is that enough? I need to go back to the editor and check, is that really addressed or it's enough with the information we have? Because the, a lot of the resources that we are counting on to do this job, the statistical advice, editors, et cetera, are volunteer time. And time is the expensive cur uh, currency. So if you are constantly going back for things that are self-obvious, you are going to be losing your, uh, your resources on your bank of favors to get the response from the, the, the people who you need to provide answers. Mm -hmm. So managing editors are constantly making uh, uh, these decisions in order to solve the, th the, the problems before it's happening and trying to anticipate before things get uh, unsolvable. And I don't know if that answers you. your question or not, Carla. Thank you, Jordi. It's just a, 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 a ask to be aware of the discussion. Uh, there is a question here from Michelle Hilton Boone, and she's asking whether re rejection rates are monitored in title protocol and full review stage and uh, compared by uh, within CRGs? As far as I'm aware, uh, there is no um, tracking of rejection. And I'm not aware that there exists uh, a list that compare the, the rejections. It's kind of complicated because when we decided the editorial management system, uh, it was not 
uh, expected to have a, a rejection point. So it, it could be implemented in different ways by different groups. So it will be complicated. And we hope that with the development of the new editorial management system, we are going to be able to get this kind of stats that will allow to, to see how we can improve on these things. It's not that saying that we should be rejecting uh, a lot of stuff, but it's good to have the sense of when people is doing it and at what point you are doing it, because it's really different to reject something at an early stage before you have done a lot of work, that when you are doing it at the last minute, when everybody has spent years working on this uh, on this product, uh, and therefore a lot of time and resources can be wasted. Um, thank you, Jordi. There is another question for you for, uh, from Helen Handel. I enjoyed the complacency warning. I suspect that we have gone wrong is some wishful thinking that some work is actually taking place. How do you monitor all this? Not so easy with Revman Web. Well, I will say, I'm not sure it's not so easy with Revman Web. It, 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 it provides a different level of information, and then we need to get used to how better uh, get it. Uh, I, I will agree with you right now. It was really easy with the all be with the Redman uh, 5.4 uh, or Redman 5 to be able to look at the information. The Redman Web provides other levels of information, and I think we're going to get a similar way of whether the authors are, are working on the topic or not. Uh, but they still, you still have the problems with this group of authors that they really enjoy working off, offline. And then you, it was not able, no, no way of seeing whether people are uh, progressing or not. So I think that it's, uh, it's going to be a, a whole new process of learning how we better monitor the, the reviews. Because I think with Rem and Web, actually, we will have a better handle of what is really happening in the review because it will not have an offer, an option to work offline. So on the long run, I think that the new editorial management system is going to provide better control of what is happening in the editorial process. And Redman Web is going to provide us a better clue of what is happening with the review too. But at, we, we may have a point in between where uh, we're going to be a bit on the dark. Let's put it that way. Thank you very much, Jordi. And um, I don't see any other questions, so I'm just going to move on now. Thank you very much for your time.